Before we get started on today's episode, I wanted to talk a little bit about the difference between a street bike that gets drag raced and a purpose-built drag bike that starts its life as a street bike. Now, if you've been following the Jixilla series, you know that we are taking a brand new sport bike and we are preparing it to allow us to go to ride on the street or ride to the drag strip if we want, drag race the bike in closed course competition and bring it back. Now there's also, uh, here in the States they're really popular, um, we have drag bikes that are purpose built. They started their life as a street bike but they're a purpose built drag bike now. This is an example of a purpose built drag bike. It runs in the grudge class so it's also known as a grudge bike. A common race bike modification is to completely remove the rotor, the caliper, um, and all the associated components to save weight. Oh my god! Okay, it's happening! Any bike without wheelie bars has the same issue that we're dealing with with Jixilla. Um, they're, they're fighting wheelies or they're fighting traction. It's a fine line. Well, one of the things they do to help fight wheelies is they'll reverse the front end, completely flip it around 180 degrees so that the caliper is in front to move that weight a, a little bit further forward to help prevent wheelies. There's a saying in drag racing, brakes just slow you down. <laughs> As you can see, we have kept the rear brakes on Jixilla, but on a purpose-built race bike, they're completely gone. Everybody panic! Oh my God! A purpose-built grudge bike will run six second quarter miles at over 200 miles per hour. It's about 50 to 60 miles an hour faster in the quarter mile than Jixilla is going to run the way she's set up. Um, they don't have the options because the front caliper and rotors removed, the rears removed. They've effectively eliminated 66% of their braking system. Now, on Jixilla, outrage, whoa, crazy, crazy, you ground on the pads. Okay, yeah, we ground on the pads to reduce some of the friction in the drag. But the beauty of it is we still have all of our brakes. Our brakes are totally functioning. And even though that pad material is missing, these bikes have incredible brakes, far more brake than we need for what we're doing at the drag strip. You could slow this thing down from 150 miles an hour with one finger, right? So by removing the material, you might have to use two fingers, but you can still stop safely without any issue whatsoever. <laughs> Hey everybody, we're back. We are on part five of chassis preparation in episode nine. So hopefully we're gonna be finished by the time we do this. We're gonna finish up the rear of the bike. We got a couple little other things to address. Um, but before uh, we really get into this, I've just got to address the elephant in the room. What's up with these glasses? <laughs> I took a thumb to the eye Ooh. during uh, <laughs> Muay Thai practice so I'm gonna wear these glasses because heaven forbid we scare the kitties so don't let it dis distract you we want to learn what's going on here so I get the question all the time Brock how much should I lower my bike another one of those <laughs> those answers yes there's a definite answer but there's a big equation to get to that final answer so what we tell people is Yet again, <laughs> it's all about safety. Let's use a little common sense here. If we slam our bike on the ground, are we going to have as much cornering clearance? No, we're not. Um, potholes and speed bumps become our enemy, especially speed bumps, because they'll flatten your pipe or tear up the bottom of your bike. So 
you've always, whenever you're using a motorcycle like we are, we're drag racing a sport bike. Um, you're going to have to make concessions. And I can assure you that when this bike was designed, the engineers never under any circumstances went, oh yeah, they're going to lower this bike as dictated or shown by the, uh, the front end issues that we had. And almost all motorcycles, you can't just infinitely lower them. You run into all kinds of different issues. So basically what we're going to do is cover the most important issues first um, and get to a starting point. You got to start somewhere. Even though I can't say you need to lower your bike 3.75 inches measured with a tape measure on a sunny day in perfect human... We're going to keep this simple. It's, it really is simple. Um, so long as you know what to look for. So let's talk about a couple of those things right now. Most, most bikes, and if you go to the drag strip, you're going to see a lot of bikes will have the bottom of their, of their uh, inner fender rub where the tire will actually rub them. Well, obviously, if you take off, launch, the bike squats and your tire is rubbing, your suspension can't work correctly. <laughs> You're definitely hampering horsepower with your tire rubbing. Plus, it, it, like the ZX14s are about the, are bad about this. We slam them, and uh, they'll they'll grind up in there. The ECU's right there, and it'll grind into the wires. So all bikes have some type of limit. You can't just infinitely lower them. Um, standard bikes, for instance, um, uh, when I a long time ago when I raced my Bandit. Uh, the standard bikes didn't have, and also most Harleys, they don't have nearly as an aggressive swing arm attack angle, and I'll try to explain that a little bit better, as modern sport bikes. Today's sport bikes, the angle of attack, which means this angle here, just keeps getting greater and greater because they keep raising the swing arm pivot. Um, on a bike like this and on a BMW, and granted I've got the thing all jacked up right now, but generally there's around four inches, which is huge. In the past, you didn't get anything close to that. So we got 16 and a half, we've got 12 and a half, so that's about four inches. So why is this attack angle important? Well, on a sport bike like this, um, what they're basically trying to do, as opposed to standard bikes in the past, and I'll get to that here in a moment, uh, but what they're trying to do is apply more power to the rear wheel. So um, which will accelerate the bike and the intention also is to help keep the front end down a little bit so that because if you squat too much sometimes you need squat if you see our drag race suspension video you'll know what I'm talking about um, but too much squat will cause it to unload the front end so uh, basically what happens on today's sport bikes because this is lower when power is applied the bike actually raises up as you're giving it power which is after, you know this is once you're moving and that helps push the tire into the track. It helps promote weight transfer. Um, if your front end's off the ground, you have basically transferred all of the weight of you and the motorcycle to the rear tire, but you want to be able to fine tune that. We are drag racing. That does not apply here. It does, of course, you can't get rid of the physics of the motorcycle, but like I said, we're making concessions here. Um, any little swing arm adjustment or if we change the sprockets which changes the uh, you know the the attack angle all changes the swing arm length man there's th there's a reason there are books this thick dedicated to all this we're going to try and simplify it all we want to get the bike as low as possible so that we can keep wheelies down we still want traction we are not going to have any type of traction problem on a motorcycle like this with a short swing arm you start getting into long bikes, that's a whole nother story. That's a whole nother video for us to address. But on a bike like this, um, we really don't have to worry about upsetting the attack angle so much because even when we upset it, the bike's still gonna work. It's gonna work great. And let me, I'll, I'll show you an image of what I mean. So it, uh, on my Bandit, which is a 1997, we're talking about a bike that's you know over 20 years old. My swing arm, was almost parallel to begin with. So as I apply power, launch, transfer weight, all the torque of the engine janking on the top rung of the chain, if this is level, all of a sudden, we're pulling it away from the track. 
my bandit, I used to go across the finish line with white smoke flying off of my tire like an old dragster because that bike just wasn't set up as nice as bikes like this today. Of course, we got around that. There's lots of way to get around it. Suspension, traction. Um, what I ended up doing on my Bandit is I kept raising the bike. Um, I was one of the few guys that I was actually working on shocks at the time. Um, everybody else had a metal rod. Now think about this for a second. We talk about swing arm angle we talk about shock suspension in theory if your bike is on a perfectly prepared track with perfect traction no bumps and you can take off without any issues your bike will be quicker in the drag strip with a strut than it will a shock problem is we don't race in a perfect world we don't have perfect track prep we don't have a track without bumps the, the tire doesn't have to recover after a bump so there's all kinds of things to, to really consider here. The one I want to focus on right now, though, are the clearance issues. And I'm going to show you what's happening on this bike as far as the clearance issues go. If you just look over here, what I've done, I basically jacked up the bike to where it's just basically took the, the tension out of the shock. Um, we went ahead and put the stock link in because we figured this is where you're going to start from. We've got the chain. It is a little on the tight side. Now, if you think about that, if the swing arm arc is going lower and, and the anti-squat is pressing the tire into the track, it's going to loosen the chain. In a perfect world, <laughs> if our swing arm pivot was in the middle of our sprocket, it would be a simple radius and no matter which way that the rear end went, the chain would always stay the same tension. That's not how it works. Motorcycles can't do that. Our pivot point is here. so. If we go in this direction, the chain's gonna get looser, which can cause miss shifts. That's why we have a tendency to run them a little bit on the loose side. But in the same respect, um, if the swing arm goes up this way when we're, when we're lowering the bike, we have to really pay attention to the tension of the chain. So let me get mocked up here a little with some other things so that I can show you what's going on. We're gonna install one of our fully adjustable window links and talk about all the clearance issues that you could run into there. The first thing we're gonna do is remove the OEM suspension link in preparation to install our Brox Performance window link. The bike is secured, as I mentioned. We just have the weight, just, uh, we're just underneath the engine. The rear tire's on the ground, so we're gonna first pull off. There's all, these, are, these things are so simple. There's only, there's only two bolts holding them but they do go in in a particular order. So, <laughs> sometimes there'll be quite a bit of tension on these, um, and that's why you gotta watch. That's why we don't have the rear end up. We don't want everything to come crashing down. Uh, little secret you can use, if, you, if you're gonna go to hammer the, tap the, uh, the bolt out, instead of going directly on the threads, just put the nut on a little bit, punch that, then we'll take our punch. All right. So, nut and the bolt, pretty simple stuff. Now we're going to go ahead and swing this down. And you can see from the factory, it's got a couple shim washers. Uh, it's also got an inner bearing race that goes inside the needle bearings. We'll leave that in for now. And then we'll just do the same thing with the other side so that we've got it out completely. Once again, just sort of make sure you put the parts and you, you want them to go back in the same way, in the same way that they came out. Put these together. And you can see there's no shim washers here, but there is a spacer, uh, uh, an, an inner bearing race that goes in in a particular orientation. So we're just going to leave these like this for now. At this point, we are able to start talking about the chain tension. Now we have this chain tighter than most guys would run. If you are on a dirt bike, don't run it that tight. You have to deal with all of the transitions that it's going to make. Let me show you this. I'm just going to take this just for demonstration purposes. Here's the amount of tension we have here. Equivalent to lowering the bike. Look at that. Much, much tighter. Which means when we're all finished, you're going to have to readjust your chain tension to match what we're doing. So now, I don't know, we'll, we'll, we'll get the bike down here in a, in a minute, but for right now, this would be the equivalent of lowering it. 
So where do, what do we have to worry about clearance wise? Well, we've still got four or five inches here. I don't think we have to worry about anything hitting here. <clears throat> On some bikes, and the ZX-10Rs are bad for this, some of the shock uh, mechanisms will, it'll actually allow the swing arm to come up and destroy the shock. The Gixxer, we don't have to worry about that problem, but you do need to worry because as you can see, this, this distance here is going to continue to get smaller and when we launch the bike, if it squats, which it will squat a little bit with a stock swing arm, it can squat a lot with an aftermarket, but this won't be there. You have to worry about what happens, you know, as you're racing the bike. So right now, clearance wise, um, this isn't too bad. What I'll do, I'll just lift this and see how far we can go to see how much clearance we potentially have here. So if I just go ahead and lift up, okay, I'm hitting. I am definitely hitting, but I'm not hitting on the bottom of the shock. I'm not hitting here. So where am I hitting? On a lot of today's sport bikes, the biggest clearance issue is right here. Between the outside of the, of the bottom of the shock, of the OD of the spring, and this particular area here. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna raise it up so that you can see what, exactly what I'm talking about. See it hit? So what does that mean? That means if I slam this bike on the ground and I'm rubbing up against the shock, I have effectively eliminated the suspension from being able to function correctly. That's what I mean about these concessions. We're gonna to have to find this happy medium where the bike is as low as we can get it, but the suspension still works. And once we're going, it's not gonna be a problem, assuming that, assuming that we're not sucking the chain up this way on this bike because the pivot angle is so aggressive, we'll still be pulling this way. So if anything, it'll be giving you more clearance. But on that initial hit, and that's what drag racing is all about, it's not necessarily about the first 60 feet, it's about the first 330, with all of them, every foot from there to there. After that, hold on the gas, shift the bike, and horsepower takes over. Um, so what, we're, what we'll do, I'll go ahead and pull this down, so the, and, I'll, and I'll show you how we actually look at how the chassis is oriented in, as it's going to go down the track. Let's do an unboxing video. Everybody loves those. Ooh, look at the window link packaging. Open it up. We got some stickers. Wow, window link. Check that out. Bearings pre-installed. So why do we call them a window link? Well, I love the idea of adjustable links. They've been around for a long time. The problem is, is that as you adjust the link, as it gets further and further away, you lose thread engagement. And I had seen at the drag strip where guys would take off, all of a sudden, bam, their, their, the back of their bike falls on the tire and they can't move. Well, we created this window. Brock's Performance Design. If you can see threads in the window, you know you have plenty of engagement because uh, that, that'll mean you'll have one and a half times the diameter, which is as strong as the rod itself. Um, so we're gonna put this on using our instructions now, because you know, we're, all, we're all modern here at Rock's Performance. I'm gonna grab my phone, uh, go to my barcode scanner. Bink, so cool. Go to our website. That brings you to our installation page. Jixer 1000, 1718, oh, 09 to 18, sorry. Uh, window link installation instructions, you pull up on those and look at what you get. Full blown window link instructions. Now, if you are young and you love your phone and your eyes work great, that's awesome. <laughs> I personally prefer our paper instructions so I don't have to get my glasses. And this goes over complete installation of the link and it even shows you the potential clearance issues on this particular bike, talks about the windows. So we'll go ahead now um, and I will we'll switch over the bearings and get this window link ready for install. So all we need to do is put this window link back in uh, about the, you know, the same way that it came out. One of the things that we tell you is you're gonna wanna use some waterproof grease inside the bearings. This is standard for all applications. 
So we've got it greased up pretty well. Now, we just come over here. The window link installs in this orientation. We put this big divot in here in case you want to lower your bike with your stock exhaust. It's not a, we don't have a cat here with a, our exhaust currently, so that's not an issue. We come in, remove this inner race, grease it up a little bit. Same thing with uh, this inner race, and then we're going to orient it in the correct position. Give it a little bit of grease. Put it back in here. All right. Get rid of this so that I can use my fingers a little bit better. We'll come in. And we will start off. This one just goes in really nicely because there's no, we have no issues whatsoever with any kind of tension. All right. So we roll this up, and what do we get? <laughs> wow, that's way off. So if you look at the bottom of our window link, we've got a little arrow. I don't know if you can see that. I've already got it greased up, so I don't want to take it out. But that arrow is pointing this way, which means if you screw this stud, if you take your wrench and go with the direction of the arrow, that will make the window link longer. Longer also means lower. So by extending the window link, we're going to make the bike lower. Well, right now, we don't have any chance of putting it together in this particular orientation. Um, if we dropped it down, now <laughs> we're, we're close. So I'd have to either move the scissor jack. Well, moving the scissor jack is the easiest way to get it to get it to do uh, to line up. But since we know we're going to be pretty much where we want to be clearance wise or somewhere near it. When we're all, when it's all said and done, depending on rider weight and a bunch of other variables, we'll end up adjusting this again, but it's very easy. So for right now, I'm just going to get in here and adjust this window link to match where the bike was on the stand because it was actually close. It may be a little too tight, but we'll figure that out later. Okay, we use a very specific uh, steel, super strong. I don't know if you've ever seen the video where I can bend these things 90 degrees. They won't break, they're really, really tough. Uh, but it starts its life as, as 5 8 hex rod. So we're gonna use a 5 8 wrench here in the center. Now, the L, if you can remember it. Um, these are right and left hand threads. So if we just loosen L, in the direction of the L, we just loosen that one. Same thing here. Now, got that turning. So now, we are going to loosen or lengthen this rod to try to get it lined up. Like I said, this is just a general starting point, right? Just for giggles, we can really fine tune it. All right. So, obviously that's not how that goes in. We'll address that later. But what I want you, wanted you to be able to see is even extended as far back and as low as this bike can get. I will show you real quick. Hopefully you can see it here. I don't want it to be too bright. But we can still see threads. So we know we have plenty of engagement even though this window link has been extended very far. So we're going to go ahead since we've got it mocked up, we'll take our shims, the thrust washers, put it on either side, and then, all right, now we've got the bolt through. So what this tells us is, is we are, we are at a great place to check to see what the, what the orientation of the chassis looks like now. We're gonna have to adjust this up and down, but we'll get to that here momentarily. We'll go ahead and get some of this stuff out of the way. Flip the kickstand so I can lower the bike. Before I lower the bike, I can move the jack, but the bike isn't going to go any lower. Obviously, with the wheel stand in. <laughs> I can't get the jack out. We've got it lowered pretty good. Okay, so if we just take a brief look, you can see we've really changed the swing arm attack ang angle. 
but it still is at a is at a decent angle thank goodness for these bikes some bikes have adjustable pivot points that you can continue to move up it's only a couple millimeters here or there because that's really important in road racing for drag racing any that we can get it up is going to be in our at our advantage with a lower chassis um, and then especially when we go with the with the longer swing arm that's going to help out so how are we looking looks pretty good let's come over here so let's just look at the overall stance of the bike we haven't lowered the front end yet uh, the bike itself looks fairly level it's really sort of hard to tell until you get the body work on but let's look over here if I remember correctly in one of the our chassis episodes we had about six inches of clearance to the bottom of the plug now we're at three and three quarter remember the two inch and three inch minimum rules that we ran into so we're still plenty safe and legal to go uh, drag racing if we want to take this to a national competition what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go ahead and lower the bike and pull the strap so we can see what the overall stance is with the strap now that's one of the things that really confuses people should the bike be level should the bike be uh, pointing downhill um, quite frankly that is a matter of rider preference some of the riders just want the thing slammed on the ground as far as they can they would want two inches here and not care if we had enough swing arm travel we, we see that all the time because the lower the bike is the quicker it's going to go in drag racing we're drag racing remember that uh, so what there's really no answer to that uh, and then with the strap also when you've got a longer bike you have the ability to, to quickly adjust the front end length if you go out make a run it spins the tire loosen the strap a little bit and it'll help help the bike squat and get more traction but let me go ahead and pull this down I'm getting ahead of myself We'll pull this down, I'll strap the front end, and then we'll take a look and see what it looks like. Check it out here. <laughs> well, I went from tippy-toed to flat-footed. That's pretty nice. Lower the strap. Now, looks like I have, and then I'd have to put tape on it, but it looks like I've got plenty of travel right now, even though it's close at the shock. But even with me, I'm 210 pounds. The rider weight we have lined up for this is 190 pounds and then we'll put a lighter guy on so uh, he wouldn't be compressing the suspension going down the track nearly as much as I would and also same, same with the weight transfer. <laughs> I'm big and fat. If I launch this bike I'm going to put more stress on uh, this particular area than a lighter guy. So right now that's pretty good. So what we're going to do step back with me and let's and let's see what we've got you can see right now with the front end with the front end strap and we can strap it even more all right so this is very difficult to see with your eye but let's assume the seat was flat at the front we've got about 30 inches at the rear about 30 and a half so we have a slightly forward pointing um, or downward pointing trajectory for the for the to start with so what we're going to do i'm going to go ahead and tighten up these uh tighten up this link and this is a great place for us to begin all right so i want to go ahead and tighten this up but one of the things we wanted i wanted to do let's just get the kickstand out of the way ah oh, well looky there not going to get out of the way we're going to have to adjust it i'll get into that in detail a little bit later but let me just show you what we're going to do we hold the stud in place this way is loosened, so we know we want to go this way to tighten. Usually it's righty tighty, lefty loosey, since this is a reverse thread. Uh, lefty is going to be tight, so if we look at our arrow, which is pointing this way for loose, we're going to come this way to tighten. Tighten it up. This part is difficult for some people to understand. Even though there is a torque spec, of course, between this, this thread and these nuts, um, most people don't own the tools that would even allow them to do it, so we just do them by feel. Um, I'll show you what I mean. I'm like, my tools are a little short right there. Go ahead and raise the bike. All right. So now, what we're gonna do, we're just gonna tighten these by, by feel. How tight are they? Tight enough not to move. But since these are jam nuts, they don't have a lot of thread engagement, so if you just torque the hell out of them and you know put a hundred or two hundred foot pounds of torque on them you can strip them 
So just snug them, and I'm I'm putting a fair amount of force. All right, that's snug, not gonna move. Same thing here. So all we're doing is holding the stud in place, and then I'm tightening the jam nut. All right, that's tight. Now for future reference, if we want to raise or lower this bike a little bit, we pay attention to the L's, and all we've got to do is count flats, right? If I turn this one flat, two flat, three flat, it's going to give a corresponding higher or lower reading. That's all you have to do with the track. You don't need to measure a bunch, bunch of stuff. Just go ahead and, uh, and, and adjust it, but keep in mind your travel. And if you see here, we've got the bike pretty low, but we still have quite a bit of travel here. And what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna lower this uh, here in a second and let you watch what the travel does with, when I'm uh, bouncing up and down on the bike. And remember, your clearances are gonna change depending on how the suspension is working. Um, needless to say, if I jump up, on the, up and down on the bike, this is gonna get closer. Watch this. I'm coming down pretty hard. And I, I still don't think that we're gonna run into that. Um, as far as the shock goes in the shock tunnel, let's let you get under over there. See what happens when I jump up and down. You can see on the initial launch, it actually gets a little bit further away. Where you have to worry about it is unloading. And this would be more on the street or over bumps. So if you go back down there and look again, if I simulate unloading the chassis to the point where, I mean, we can, I actually took the bike off the ground. You're not gonna unload it, unload it any more than that. So right now, I think that we're in a pretty good place to be able to take this bike um, to the drag strip and give her a shot. But first, <laughs> this is our Brock stand, which was already pre-installed. If, uh, once again, bling, we'll unbox all the information that you need is on the QR code instructions. But what, what we really emphasize here is the length. Um, how long does it need to be? Really simple. Long enough so that your bike doesn't fall over this way, but short enough so that your bike doesn't fall over this way. And whether or not you have the strap on and tight really makes a difference. So when we set these up, we have it, we have it strapped down. Um, we go ahead and shorten it up, short, uh, lower the bike, keep it short, and then we undo the strap. And if, it, and if, if it's still over too far, we'll go up, we'll, we'll lengthen the uh, kickstand a little bit. If it's not over far enough, we'll shorten the kickstand. So anyway, um, everything you need to know is in the instructions. One helpful tip we give you in, a, in our, uh, our, our Brock stand instructions is if you just take some coins, and all bikes are different, the longer the spring is, the more coins, the stiffer they are, the, the more this helps. But on a bike, like for instance, you just take the coins and shove them in between the coils, shove as many as you can in there, and what that does is, is it loosens up this spring so you can get your spring puller in there, helps, helps with those springs because they can be really, really, really tough to get off sometimes. All right, so what we're gonna do, we'll lower the bike, put that up, and see how much we can lower this. All right, so that, this is actually our road kick stand. And unfortunately, by the time we get this over, uh, we're, it's not gonna work out. So we're gonna change the tip on this. The bike's been in, at stock height its, its entire life for all of its rides. So if you're planning on lowering your bike, you're gonna, wa you're gonna wanna get, um, the kickstand that has the smaller the the smaller tip and we call it our race stand so we're going to grab a race uh a race tip here real quick we're going to come back and uh tighten these up and we still have to do the final torque on the uh, window link bolts the stock bolts so we'll do that here right now of course uh the o the original oem bolts do have a torque spec we'll go ahead and snug them up here and then we'll torque them to 59 foot-pounds. Now that we have the chassis sitting where we want it to be for drag racing, 
I want to go ahead and address the side stand here. <clears throat> With the bike on the ground and straight up, you can see this is, uh, this is our street foot. And what this is designed for, our window links also allow you to raise your bike. So if you road race and you need additional clearance, um, you can raise the bike up. But say you run into the same problem with your OEM side stand, this foot allows the bike to be raised. Now, since we are lowering the bike, let me pull this out real quick. I previously loosened this, and, and I want to make sure that you guys understand. You, we tell you in the instructions to lock tight these screws. Now, lock, lock tight, blue lock tight, a medium thread locker is just fine. Because the problem is, if you don't lock tight it, the bolt falls out, your foot falls out, <laughs> and then you're stuck when you stop and go, hey, where's my stuff? So anyway, um, you can see the difference here. This is, this is the track version. This is the street version. We're going to go ahead and put this. I'm just going to guess for now, quite frankly. All right, so that's, that's really short. What we're going to test is if I loosen the bike up now. Now, we have the bike strapped. It could actually be strapped a little bit more. So let's see where it's going to be. You know, that actually looks pretty good. Uh, the problem I think we're going to run into is when we unstrap it, it may, be, it may lean a little too much this way. Let's check. All right. So, and it's hard to see on the stand if you can come behind, come behind the bike. But <laughs> we're still at a pretty serious lean here. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to adjust it. I had one hole showing. I'm going to go ahead and adjust it out a little bit, and we give you plenty of what, plenty of room. So a, a lot of guys will they'll cut their forks, they'll cut their oil pan, they'll have their bike slammed on the ground, which means they can go all the way to here. Um, we had one hole. We'll go with two holes. Yet again, we're just going to try it real quick. Unstrapped. That's better. I'm going to go ahead and adjust it one more. That's pretty nice. Now the question comes back. Remember I said you got a lot of variables here. You have to set them yourself. Now I'm going to go back, strap the front end again, and make sure we're still okay at this length. All right. I can already see where we're, we're going to run into an issue at that length. When I come back, lower the front end. Now the bike is sitting almost straight up and down. You walk away from your bike, the wind blows, it falls over. That tells us we just wanted to be somewhere in between those two settings. All right, look at that. Now, with the bike almost fully strapped, we still have some lean into it. If I can get a friend to help me pull this front end down a little bit more, we should still have enough. So two holes showing looks like where we want to be. Okay, guys, we're going to go ahead and Loctite this. But as a reminder, Loctite is bolt glue. Bolt glue does not stick to grease. So we're going to go ahead, clean the surface of the threads, blow it off. Please use a respirator if you're afraid of the fumes from the uh, brake cleaner. All right, plenty on here. All right. The torque spec on this six millimeter bolt is 80 inch pounds. That's six and a half foot pounds. That's too low for my inch foot pound wrench to go. I don't have my inch pound wrench with me. I've got Loctite. I'm going to use my head. There. It's not going to come out. Use a torque wrench if you have one, and you must use torque wrenches. Otherwise, tighten it enough where it's not going to fall out. We have the majority of the chassis finished. We're going to start messing with little things. If you remember, in our first video, we talked about these reflectors. We want to pull these off, but as, as you see, they've got a shoulder there. And they put shoulders on the bolts so that when you tighten them, it doesn't cause stress cracks in the, uh, in the plastic. So I want to show you here real quick. A lot of times they make it easy, and all you have to do is try one of the other bolts from the fender but if you look that has a much larger shoulder than this so that's not going to work out so what we found <laughs> we went on a little scavenger hunt and look at what we found 
a Hayabusa front fender bolt that has a shoulder on it. We'll put the little rubber isolator in here and now we've cleaned up the front end. You can use any bolt you want. We would recommend a shoulder bolt to keep from disrupting the plastic, keep from breaking it. Look how much nicer that is. And guess what? It's finally going to happen. I'm moving to the rear of the bike and we are going to get rid of that stock rear fender. I wanted to stop and point something out real quickly. Now we have the chassis sitting where we're going to begin. As I mentioned, that chain is super tight, so I'm going to have to loosen that up. Um, now, I've taken the, the bike down off the jack stands, so if I measure here, we're at about 13 and 3 eighths. If I measure here, we're about 12 and a half. So out of that four inches of positive attack angle we had, we've reduced it to nearly, to nearly nothing. And when we launch, um, when the bike squats, it's going to extend this up tight and it'll tighten the chain a little bit until we get going where then it'll still have a positive angle uh, so the anti-squat will kick in and uh, it'll help plant the tire on the ground. So we're in a really good setup for where we want to be right now um, and we're just going to continue on. All right, it's five flats. Still a little loose. That might be a bit on the loose side. We'll do, we won't know until we get the bike down the track to see whether or not it's going to shift properly. No more. <laughs> the way is Suzuki designed this, you can't just pull off all of that fender and yuckness and then screw it back on. I don't know if you want to come over here and look, but you can see even if we put the screws back in, there's nothing to hold it. So what we're going to do, we got a little tail tidy here. This one's a little more robust than I'd like to see, but it's, it's all we have right now. Um, really nice piece. And once we put this back on, it'll hold all this in place and uh, look much cleaner aerodynamically really clean up the back of the bike, but it still allows us a place to put our license plate if we like. Uh, some people mount the plates way up in here. Uh, law enforcement around here won't let us get away with that. Well, this looks much nicer. So, great news. We are finally to the point where we can start reassembling the bike to put it back together. Now, um, I'm not going to show you all that. We already covered it. If you want to see how to put it together, watch the other videos in reverse. <laughs> um, we're going to get going here. I'll stop and show you a couple of slight little details uh, that we're also going to add as part of the assembly. And then we're going to start getting this bike ready to put in the trailer and go to the racetrack. It is time to bring this project full circle. So if you remember when we very first began this series, we had a stock street bike that we wanted to make ready to go down the drag strip. We wanted to improve aerodynamics. We wanted to improve center of gravity. We wanted to do everything we could to make this bike as quick as possible. Stock wheelbase, all bolt-on parts. So if you start here at the beginning, we've got the bike strap. You can see we've greatly reduced this area in here. We took off the reflectors. Uh, we took off the turn signals. <laughs> that may get some racer tape unless I can find something that looks nicer. Um, the mirrors have been replaced with our carbon fiber block offs. Uh, not only are they a lot more aerodynamic, but they're really cool looking. We're drag racing. If you're on the street, you need mirrors. To move back here, we put on a tank pad because the rider is going to be really trying to go as far forward as possible. We don't want to scratch things up. We installed a stepped seat. Yet again, trying to make the entire center of gravity go down. If you take the rider weight and you move him down, it's going to help the bike. The rider will also feel more comfortable because they can get a whole lot of, uh, they can get a whole lot of feet on the ground, more controllable. Um, I can actually sit on this thing bent knee now, so I don't have a real big end seat. And then the other thing, we leave a little step here from an aerodynamic standpoint. 
Once the rider gets into second gear, he can press back here. This gap causes you to slow down, and we notice it at the racetrack. Um, you can sort of see the difference in seats here. Uh, we left a little bit of padding on it because we are going to ride it. Uh, some guys pull all that off, but pretty nice setup. If you remember, we talked about the safety of the bike. Two inch ground clearance versus three. Since this bike doesn't have a billet pan, it really needs three inch clearance to the hardest part, which means if we just sort of scrape here along the plastic, it's perfect. If you want to look at some of the items that we've taken off, this is really just dead weight. Things we don't need to do at the racetrack. What you can't see is that under the seat, we installed a new full spectrum P10 battery. It's five pounds lighter than the stock battery, the lead acid battery. It also has this really cool IPT reset, which means that if you accidentally leave your key on and you drain your battery, lift up the seat, press the button, start your bike up, ride home. And now, <laughs> for the piece de resistance, everybody always asks, how much horsepower are those stickers worth? I know that's five horsepower. Let's see if we can hear it. you see us we will be getting ready to go to the drag strip with this bike and show everyone exactly why we made all these modifications until then Brock for Brock's performance we'll see you then